You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan Defined Risk Mutual Funds, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the, the Advisor's, advisor's option. option. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the Advisor's Option, the program here on the network where we break down the sometimes scary, sometimes impenetrable, sometimes quite useful, like these days, world of options for you, the busy financial advisor, asset manager. Maybe you're a little bit concerned or probably these days a lot concerned about what's going on in the markets and volatility, and you're wondering, how can I use these options things to better hedge and protect and perhaps grow my clients' accounts. Well, we've got you covered. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned Options Insider Radio Network. Hope you guys are enjoying the slew of content that is hitting the airways for you guys. I know a lot of you are stuck at home. A lot of you also have concerns about the markets, which is a 
nice double whammy, a perfect storm, if you will, for a podcast or two. And we've got a few of those for you. So hopefully you're enjoying those. If you listen to this program, you haven't subscribed to our full network yet. What are you waiting for? 13 plus years of great goodness over there for you guys to enjoy. No matter what level of options trader you are, we got something for you over there. What type of content you like, futures, options, volatility, equity options, all sorts of fun stuff. We got it over there for you. And of course, keeps those questions, those comments, those insights coming. We do enjoy hearing from you guys, particularly in the, shall we say, troubled times. And joining me on the program to help make sense of this madness. You know, this show is kind of like my barometer. We do it once a month and we could just see what's going on, what changes have been wrought in the marketplace over the subsequent 30 odd days. And man, every time we do this show, it gets more interesting. Joining me to help me break it all down. First, we have from the far northern reaches, the hinterlands of these United States. We are joined once again by Mr. Matt Amberson, the principal and the founder over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services. Mr. Matt, welcome back to the Advisors Options, sir. How are you holding up there in the far reaches of New Hampshire? It's been crazy. I'm looking forward to making sense of all this madness with uh, the best crew in the business, Mark. Oh, good. You're the guy who can make sense of it. Good. Okay, perfect. We, we dialed the right person then for the program. And also joining us, swinging the dial a little bit farther east and indeed south all the way out to scenic and sunny Puerto Rico. We were joined once again by Mr. Chris Hausman, the Portfolio Managing and Managing Director of Risk over there at Swan Global Investments. Mr. Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Director of Risk, welcome back to the program to you as well, sir. Hey, guys. Thank you very much. Good to be back on here. Some normalcy here for once. Yes. All, all is normal. All is right with the world. We always rally four plus percent in a day, right? That's, that's just normal. That shows what the new normal is these days. And also joining us, dialing that, that dial all the way back around, keeping it about the same southern latitude there, but moving it over a bit to Florida, where we are joined once again, I am pleased to say, Mr. Eric Cott, the Director of Education and Business Development for OIC. Mr. Cott, welcome back to the Advisors Option Program. Sir, how goes your self-isolation? Well, thank you, guys. And, uh, Mark, I'm glad you're staying positive and productive and proactive in this pandemic time. And I just want to uh, say to Chris and Matt, I hope uh, your families and company and coworkers are safe and, uh, and glad to be here. We're glad you're here as well as we head on into... The buzz. Busy financial advisors and asset managers don't have time to follow the latest developments from the world of options. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right. Welcome to the buzz. This is the portion of the show where we will typically break down some interesting aspects and developments and trends in the world of options that pertain to you, the advisor. Maybe you're not aware of, maybe an event, maybe some sort of study or research. At uh, this time, the buzz, everyone's buzzing about one thing, which is the endless turmoil in the marketplace as a result of the coronavirus pandemic here. We are, of course, coming off the heels of yet another historic week, and this week is setting up to be another historic week for different reasons. Uh, last week, of course, we're recording this towards the end here of March last week, listeners, was the worst week since the financial crisis of 2008 for pretty much every major index. Uh, we saw pretty much the S&P rise or fall by at least 4.8% in the eight sessions prior to last Thursday, uh, I believe that was. That's a streak you only saw back, we have to go all the way back to November of 1929, so pretty much the kickoff there of the Great Depression to find a, a similar, similar time frame of that. In case you're wondering, of course, we hit level one circuit breakers four times, halting the market during that period as well. We have now dropped, well, not now because we are in a different, different paradigm right now, but leading into this week, we had dropped right below the Christmas Eve 2018 lows, which of course in the S&P, that was the nadir for the market, if you recall, right at the end, right on Christmas Eve. Of 2018, listeners, we had a pronounced sell-off starting in October of that year, sold off hard into December. Then we rallied hard throughout all of 2019, pretty much, and it was looking like the bull might continue to 2020. And then other exogenous concerns 
interfered. On top of that, from a pure options perspective, we are in somewhat uncharted waters. You know, when I first got into this business and, and Chris and indeed Matt, uh, we were market makers, you know, and that was kind of the deal. And everyone, even back then, I first walked on the floor of the SIBO in 97. I think Matt predated me by a, a few decades, let's say. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, And I'm not sure when Chris uh, got in down there, but you know, the, even back then in 97, everyone was looking ahead to things like the ISC and lamenting the future of all computers taking all the traders' jobs. That was what everyone was talking about even back then. took a little while for that finally to come to pass, a little longer than probably most, most of those uh, diehard grim folk suspected. But now, as of course, the pandemic closing all trading floors, so SIBO, CME, NYSE, Amex, you know, Pcoast, Philly, all the options markets had, that had trading floors left are all shuttered. So we are now effectively in a fully 100% electronic market. That goes for equities now here as well with NYSE shuttering their trading floor earlier or late last week, uh, I believe. That means legacy, thoroughbred pit products like SPX and the Euro dollars. Now 100% electronic. No one's ever done this before. We are definitely in uncharted waters. And so uh, people thought that might lead to some issues with liquidity. I think maybe we'll get into that in a little bit. We have seen some market makers, some storied uh, market makers out there like Ronin uh, actually get liquidated, which is a sad state of affairs. And I traded with Stafford, which was an early incarnation of Ronin. A lot of traders did. Back in the day, they have a deep bench and index expertise. So to see that happen to a firm like that is a bit concerning. Uh, but we'll get to all of that in a little bit. And, of course, volatility hitting new records. Looking at the VIX out there, hit a new all-time closing high uh, back on the 16th, listeners, of 82 69, if you're wondering when the previous high, that was back in November 20th of 2008, hit 80.86. That's closing highs on intraday. A little bit of a different story. And also by a bit of a frame of reference, the S at that time was 752. So a little bit a little bit less than where it was when the SPX closed, when the SPX, I should say, when the VIX hit that all-time closing high. I have more data more things to talk about, but let's let's get into that. And of course, before I even get to that, I have to address too. We are now in this new environment of this upswing—a two trillion dollar stimulus package just announced by the government dwarfs pretty much anything else the government has ever done from a recovery aid sort of uh, size. If, if you're wondering by way of comparison, inflation adjusted the New Deal about eight hundred billion. So this is two trillion. <laughs> So different, obviously, population different then versus now. There's some other ways you can look at it per capita that are a little bit different. But still, straight up numbers, inflation adjusted, this dwarfs even the New Deal. And the market's liking what it's seen. We've seen a couple of days of rallying. Uh, yesterday was pretty much the mother of all rallies, S&P up 9, almost 9.5%. And we're seeing today uh, S&P up about 3.5, almost 4%, was up 4% at one point. So they're liking the stimulus that leading people to think, hey, is the worst over? What's going on? Vol trending actually to stay a little bit uh, frothy, about about a 61 in the VIX right now. That's confusing people. The VIX and the SPX have been moving in lockstep a lot lately, but there's a lot to unpack out there. So let's get to it. Let's start. You know, we're talking about uh, volatility, liquidity concerns, all these interesting things. So let's start with the director of risk. Mr. Director of risk, sir, obviously these are kind of the go-to times for you guys over there in Swan. This is this is what you guys live for. This is the hedged equity. This is on the cover of the brochure. Times like this, sir. So uh, walk us through what's been going on out there in Swan Land. what you're seeing out there, what your thoughts are on the current volatility regime, what we're seeing from an overall market directional status. You know, are you, are you buying into this bounce? And what's it been like for you guys trying to get your, your SPX hedges and other things off in these extreme environments that are now all electronic, sir? A lot, a lot packed in there. Have at it. That is a lot packed in there. So I'll start with the good part is that we have been hedged throughout this downturn. Um, so the pain hasn't been as bad as straight up equity type products out there. Um, you know, it's one of the things that we've always said here is always invested, always hedged. So, you know, the good thing is buying those long term leaps at a relatively cheap or low volatility. And now they have finally been able to expand. So the trick really is to monetize those and reestablish our hedges, which we have been in the process of, you know, uh, you know, before the, the rally the last couple of days. So um, that's been the good news. Um, I think on the liquidity front, it's been a little bit more challenging. I feel you've got some market fragmentation right now because, you know, people are working remotely. Um, the communication isn't there. Air. You don't have, a, especially in the SPX, you don't have a pit to go down to, which means as, you know, a pit represents a lot of information, right? It represents pricing information. Well, you don't have that right now like it used to be or as 
fluid as it used to be. So um, certain shops, I know we're, we're dealing with certain of our brokers that have basically told us we're only doing delta neutral trades. Um, we're only doing this kind of trade right, right now. We've had some of our prime brokers also tell us that they're not taking tradeaways, meaning they're not going to accept anything from another broker, meaning we have to trade with them directly. So it's been a little bit different. Um, we're still getting everything done, okay? So don't I don't want anyone to think that well we're not be we're not able to trade. And I think Eric can can shed a lot more light on this. We're still getting everything done. There's still volume and trading. It's just a little bit more challenging, and I think everyone shouldn't be surprised. I mean, you, you know, again, we're, everybody's trading from remote, remote locations in a way, and so the information of pricing and where certain things um, it's just not there where it used to be. Um, as far as all toys concerned, yeah, damn high. That's what I'm going to say, right? Um, and I, I, I've been seeing a lot of people saying, well, the markets are up and the VIX is, is not down enough or the VIX is up and that the VIX is broken. And that tells me, okay, you guys don't understand how this works, right? Um, the VIX measures volatility. The volatility can be up or down. Yes, there's a negative correlation um, between underlying SPX movement and the VIX. But, you know, like a 64, 65 VIX in implies a 4 to 5% daily move a day. It doesn't know if it's going to go up or down. Okay, It's just moving. And that's why if you see the VIX today, it's pretty firm with a 4 or 5% move up today. And even yesterday, I was everyone was saying, oh, VIX should have been crushed yesterday. Well, no, we were up 10%. It is where it is. And things are actually um, bidding up uh, as we rally. So the interpretation could be um, that the market isn't believing this bounce, that this is just a uh, news-induced bounce because of the, the liquidity package that was just passed. Um, and as far as the overall picture, I think the the vicious, violent wave is over and, you know, horrible stories about shops shutting down. I think there's I know of other short vol shops that have shut down. And I think, you know, when the dust settles, we're going to start finding out more and more news of other other short volatility shops that couldn't handle this type of move. But I don't think that the if I'm wrong and this is going to be the V-shaped recovery of all V-shaped recoveries. And uh, but I, I think. If you look back to 29, if you look back to 87, um, yeah, this, this looks like the violence is over, but there should be at least one more test of the recent low here. Below that, I think it's going to be news induced on on what's happening with the virus and, and how we're tackling that. Below that, I think you know 2100, 21 half is a good place to start nibbling. Um, but below that, it's going to take some economic news. Okay, things aren't as good. We're not, you know, corporations really are hurting as bad as we think or worse. And and but technically. Like I said, we bounced the low the other day was like 2190 ish. And I've been saying 2100, 21 half is probably a good place to start nibbling. So it made sense that we should be bouncing right now, but I don't think it's going to hold. Yeah, it's hard to have a lot of faith. I mean, obviously, this is two days now of rallies. That's something we haven't managed to sustain two up days. And of course, today's not over yet, but two up days in a row. We haven't seen this uh, since, uh, oh, back in mid February, February 12th. They haven't had more, one up, more than one up day in a row. Uh, since then, this is also the second 9% plus rally yesterday was uh, this month. And today, of course, not quite 9%, but a little less than half of that. So still interesting stuff. You know, we saw our buddy, Mr. Schwartz, the flow master. He's been on some of our shows earlier this week. He was tweeting out uh, displayed liquidity and size in SPY. He was looking at SPY. He'd probably make a similar analogy uh, to SPX. He says, uh, over the past month, displayed quotes four times wider than normal in SPY as displayed size drops Nearly 80%. Like I said, Chris, that's pretty much for SPY, but it sounds like even though that's all the case, and again, as you mentioned, some of this is to be expected. We're in fast markets quite literally now. Uh, so in, you know, liquidity providers are going to widen out. That's kind of the nature of the beast. They're also going to show less size. So some of that is to be expected, but still it sounds like you're still able to get stuff done out there in the s sir. that's not really hindering you guys too much. No, it's not. I mean, we've been pretty active. The desk has been very, very busy and active. And, um, you know, I've been telling those guys, you know, I'm not on the execution desk anymore, but um, they're doing a great job. They're resting. I'm trying to keep them from not doing all the minutia stuff and focus. This is a time when you really got to focus on what you're doing, uh, especially with the with the new challenges. But, yeah, we, we are getting things done. Um, it's just challenges of, of there's a lot of trading good going on there's a lot of different things going on at the same time and you just have to prioritize and, and knock it all through but we we're, we're built for this i mean we've got a lot of good technology that's like being tested right now and getting us through so that's the good news uh it's just having to adapt to you know you call a certain broker and they can call five six liquidity providers all of a sudden and get your market well they only have one or two that they can get to really quickly so it doesn't mean that things aren't getting done but it's just not you know price discovery is a little bit more challenged right now that's all i'm saying that's a nice nuanced way <laughs> to put it there, sir. Price discovery is a little bit 
more challenged. Well, it's someone who's not challenged in these environments is, of course, the man who kind of kind of saw this coming earlier in the year when we were all back in January, kind of hemming and hawing and saying, you know, this seems like the market's really kind of underpricing this this coronavirus risk at the time. You know, volatility VIX was in the low teens. The term structure for VIX futures wasn't really pricing an explosion of vol looking that far out. And it seemed like we were all kind of scratching our heads and saying, you know, this this seems like something is off here. And yet Matt uh, Matt waded into that fire. He said, you know, he thinks this is the inflection point everyone's been talking about. This is the moment when the warm is turned. The, the volatility we're going to see in the future is real. And he thought we were in for a systemic regime change, which, of course, at least for the last few months, we have indeed seen. So, Mr. Matt... All eyes are on you now, sir. You're our canary in the coal mine here on this program. What are your thoughts on everything I just asked Chris goes for you as well? What we're seeing on the vol side, the crazy swings, the recent moving in lockstep of the S and VIX, which is throwing everybody into a tizzy, uh, concerns about displayed liquidity, market makers going away. Now, perhaps with this stimulus, is the worm turning? Are you buying this bounce? A, a lot to unpack there, sir. How, have at it in whichever order you desire. Mark, uh, very interesting times we're living in. Uh, as you said, back in January, we talked, and um, I was starting to call that this is this is looking bad. I was interviewed with Reuters. I said, we're going to be down 10 to 20%. I was only wrong on the 20% kind. And so it was good for a lot of our clients. You know, w- 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 with our back testing, where, you know, we have a short component and we got out of the short component then. And we have these, you know, much like uh, Swan does, these very long term puts that, uh, you know, very far out of the money. Uh, more than two year puts and those have absolutely blown up. And so those, you know, and we're, you know, monetizing those. Um, and so, yeah, it, it worked out well. Uh, you know, my personal trading, um, you know, I have a lot of individual stocks that I like and I buy individual puts on those. So, um, I actually sold out of the stock and, and then tried to close the puts, but now some of that liquidity, you know, I, I, I you know, I saw Henry's post and, and I posted on his, LinkedIn chat and you know I said that's great for the S and P 500 SPX SPY but once you get past that the the widths the bid ask widths are just astronomically high it's just it's a very sad day for me as an old market maker who uh, argued with uh, the exchanges way back in the 90s and 2000s about what they were doing was eventually going to cause what we're seeing right now um, it is as bad as it. it I've ever seen it. I mean, that's an understatement. It's just gone. It's the, there's so little liquidity in the, uh, names past, you know, the, maybe the top 50, uh, you know, we, we do these studies of components of this, of the S and P 500. And we do the weighted average of the bid ass spread and we do it in volatility points. And, and, um, it's gotten to, about 20 vols, 20 vols wide, which in, just to give it some context, the, in 2008, it only got to something like 11 vol points wide, which was crazy, but, and we've, we've way surpassed that. So they're not even pretending to make money in, or make markets in, in uh, many of the stocks, especially the weeklies. The weeklies are, are, are no bit at, at, at nothing, you know, at, at a huge number. So, it's been difficult to get out of some of the positions I try daily just to, you know, put in an offer and then now my offer becomes, the, you know, my mid-market offer or below mid-market offer becomes the ask, you know, where I'm offering it below fair value and still that becomes the ask, you know, and then when you bid for something that becomes a bid. So it, it's 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 quite bad out there. It's sad. Um, you know, we talked directly uh to the exchanges uh when we were out at, at oic i remember was sitting in the pool with eric in in arizona and talking to you know what are we going to do about some of these less liquid names and you know we need more market makers you can't you know the, you can't expect you know just a few market makers to have to handle all the new strikes and all that and it you know it's just What's happened is is the economics and the market data costs and everything has made it impossible for small market making shops to you know participate in some of these small names in, in my opinion. So it's you know it's gotten very bad. It's a very sad 
sad time for us because we do, you know, there's a lot of, of great information to get about uh, options. And, you know, my, my, my background is in finance and optionality, you know, pricing risk is a, is a hugely important thing. And it can be done on individual names and needs to be done on individual names. But if there's no market makers making any any type of uh, rational market, you can't really get much information out of it. So, you know, that's, that's how I'm feeling about it, Mark. I'm, you know, I mean, I think that the option information has been great for us. We've been able to predict the top. Uh, we we uh, started talking to people about getting or, or how we were less bearish, you know, about, um, you know, when we hit the December lows about 231. You're, that was a little. That turned out to be a little bit early, but now we're w- up way past where we were. We're saying, uh, you know, just looking at the levels of volatility, and now we're looking at volatility bouncing around, you know, between a low of, of 45 and a high of 75 in the um, spy implied volatility. And what we're, you know, we've we've shown these graphics where, you know, if, if you had uh, in 2008 is the last time we, we've seen I- any type of a model about this. Uh, if you're a buyer, when the vol, vol gets up to 75, and, and incidentally, it's about eight to 10 points higher in the VIX uh, than the SPY, um, versus you know going down to 45, and you get, and that's a time to to start lightening up. So you know w- our option information and that type of stuff has been working great, and uh, you know I only wish that that we had some better markets. The SPY actually has been a great market, uh, considering they're actually way less than. Uh, way less wide than they were in 2008, but I, I'm afraid that's all they're. You know, they're, it seems like that's all they're concentrating on is just keeping those markets, and the rest of them are are, are pretty hurting. Mark. Yeah, you know, this is a kind of something that's been building for some time now. You know, you don't exactly see a lot of market makers entering the business year after year. Something unfortunately, there's no options industry conference this year. I'll get to that in a little bit. That's something I always talk about there every year with most of the firms, most of the exchanges. What can we do to get more market makers? In the business, specifically for times like this, that's when we need them. And yet, uh, yeah, that's that's an issue. And of course, you're getting beyond your spies, your vixes, your apples, some of the ones that are near and dear to the space and to the market making firms. And even in those names, for one, that the money, you get beyond that, it gets a little dicey from an overall spread perspective. So if you're out there, listeners, uh, be careful. Really quickly, uh, you know, I had Chris weigh in on this. I'm curious your thoughts as well. I have our listeners weighing in. I'll get to them in a second. Uh, Matt, obviously, right now we're in this kind of near-term historic rally over the last couple of days. Uh, are, you, are you buying what the market is selling? Are you feeling this is a bit of an inflection point again, or are you thinking more dead cat bounce territory, sir? Yeah, I'm very bearish. <laughs> I, I think that you know, they're, you know, the Fed, Fed's throwing everything but the kitchen sink. They're not, being, uh, they're not being honest with what's really going on. I think it's going to get much worse. Uh, you know, I would I would take this opportunity to to lighten up and you know what and I'm uh, you know I'm going to start getting back into the vol as it as it comes down and you know I think it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think we're in for a pretty uh, long and, and pronounced bear market. Um, you know, testing. You know the you know there there are some points that we're going to test to. 211, but I think it's eventually going to back, get back to, uh, you know, the election of 2016, you know, around 180 area, and then and then we'll see. Um, but it, I, I think it's going to get, uh, yeah, much uglier for a prolonged period. Unfortunately, I uh, hate to be the bearer of bad news, Mark, but you know. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. We love throwing the bad news out there, so I'm just kidding. But of course, it is uh, it is. It is hard to uh, argue that assessment. Let's throw a little light, a little ray of sunshine. When I want a ray of sunshine, I go on out to my man there, Mr. Eric Cott uh, from the OIC. You know, Mr. Cott, you know, there are concerns about liquidity and spreads. And we are, like I mentioned at the top of the show, in uncharted waters from an options market perspective. We've never had everything fully electronic before. I'm, I've so far, to have a glass half full approach, I've so far been pleasantly surprised that we haven't seen more terrible issues. I thought when we first opened up that first Monday, I, I, everything was electronic for the first time. I thought that was really going to be just a disaster. There'd be no liquidity, crazy spreads, no volume really going up, uh, You know, market-making firms perhaps blowing out left and right. We haven't really seen a lot of that. We've seen spreads widening out. As Matt alluded to, we've seen you know not exactly a great amount of displayed size out there, but still papers getting done. In fact, a 
ridiculous, some might say, amount uh, of volume is going up in the option space right now, despite the fact that spreads are wide, despite the fact that you know displayed size is not really there. You got to kind of dig into the book a little bit to get any size done. Mr. Cott, uh, cheer us all up. Walk us through some some of the records that you guys at OCC have been setting of late from an options volume perspective, sir. Well, I want to you know thank Matt and uh, Chris as well because both involved in the industry and you know Chris really kind of you know echoed sort of the sentiment that you know it's just taking a little while longer. I mean, look, you know we had all exchanges trading electronically as you said, Mark, on Monday, but we've had a lot of efficiency. I mean, you know these are periods of record sustained volume. You know, for you know Mark, for your listeners, two of the highest trading volume and trading days on record. You know, we all four of us spoke. Last month, which I believe was on Wednesday the 26th and Tuesday, February 25th, we saw 42.2 million contracts and you know about 4.4 million trades, which was at that time the number one record day for OCC. However, we go a few days ahead, Thursday the 27th, we outpaced that with 45.4 million contracts with 4.7 million trades. That was the number one top, you know, single uh, trading day on record. And, you know, it's interesting and coincidental, Mark, that your podcasts, you know, kind of uh, operated in between that window. And then, you know, conversely on triple witching we had last week, you know, with 30 million contracts. So the efficiency is there. And I, again, you know, appreciate what Chris sort of said. It just, you know, it takes a little bit of time. I think everybody is trying to figure out this sort of new norm. Uh, also want to, you know, convey to Matt, you know, I think a lot of the analytics and charts that Matt is doing are really valuable to the advisors right now. And I know you're going to talk about that later, Mark, but, you know, from the standpoint of what Swan does, but also conversely for what Matt does at ORATS, I think it gives a real sort of foundation to advisors as they start to analyze this stuff. So hopefully adding a little bit of bright news. Let's keep the bright ball rolling. Let's stay where we just were, and we'll go back around the horn uh, the other way. Mr. Cott, you're usually, usually on the show, in addition to your volume and your studies, you're usually my go-to guy for the boots-on-the-ground take. What's really going on out there in the advisor space? What are advisors talking about? What are they asking about? What are you hearing at conferences and events and when advisors come up to you? Uh, unfortunately, no one. There are no, literally no boots on the ground right now. No, no one can go anywhere. So you're instead, you're my go-to source for virtual boots on the ground. And you have done just that not too long ago. You guys at OIC have assembled a advisor's roundtable effectively, get a different swath of different people's opinions, out, people who are out there actually managing money as advisors and asset managers out there who are using options and who get their perspective, get their you know, expertise on what they're seeing, on what they're hearing out there from their clients right now. I know the, the Swan folks are actually a part of that. So they're, they're represented on there as well as a number of other firms out there. So give us the virtual take. What are the virtual boots on the ground right now? What are they saying? What are these advisors hearing? What concerns and issues and questions are they coming to you guys at OIC with right now, sir? Well, I'll tell you, Mark, yes. Uh, we are fortunate enough that Randy Swan is a volunteer member. We, we call this the Advisor Leadership Council, and we have representation from many different type of firms, from broker-dealers to registered investment advisors. We're also really proud at OIC to say that we have about 40% of the advisors on that committee are female advisors, so really have a great diversity. I guess the virtual feedback, and we spoke to the group last week, is that a number of these advisors, Mark, have been in the business for quite some time and have already been talking prior to this, kind of how Matt was, and I know Chris as well, his firm, talking to their clients before this about not being complacent, talking about the volatility in the market, having discussions about ways they can hedge some of that downside, talking about managing and mitigating risk. And we have heard from advisors at different firms on this committee, Mark, who said, look, not only have these clients been talking to them uh, or actually the advisor been talking to them sort of off the ledge, but they've also seen it as sort of a referral. They've actually had clients who said, hey, I have a neighbor of mine that is quite interested in the strategy that you put on. It could have been a collar. It could have been a put spread or something. And their advisor isn't doing that. 
would you be interested in talking to them? So I think it's separating and differentiating, Mark. You know, we did this Cerulli study years ago, which you were kind enough about, you know, um, having us talk about on your show. And one of the things that came out of that study was is advisors who are proactive and kind of talk about this stuff differentiate and start to see sort of this referral network come in. So they weren't unprepared. I guess the thing about it is, Mark, is that so many advisors out there are using this buy and hold asset allocation strategy, you know, at the beginning of the year. And now when we have this pandemic issue going on and things are, you know, conversely going down, either they're not maybe picking up the phone or they're just, you know, trying to divert the conversation where a lot of the advisors who are using option strategies find this to be the real canary in a coal mine. I'm not glad to hear that people are burning up their phones, but from an options, because the concerns are, are warranted and merited out there, but from a, an options-oriented perspective from people out there who are looking for hedging in this, in this environment, this certainly is, you know, the times I've often said when you're an options-oriented advisor, when you can provide hedging as well as, of course, income and speculation, all the other things you can use options for, these are the times when really you're going to stand apart from the crowd and really the times when people are going to be the path to your door. Maybe people you called six months ago and said, hey, you thought, have you thought about maybe doing some sort of collar or hedging strategy against your long equity portfolio? Maybe they slammed the phone in your face because they said, look at this, a bull market. Why would I need to hedge? Now they're going to call you back and say, hey, tell me a little bit more about that, that hedging strategy you talked about. I'm curious for you guys, Chris, you guys live in this, uh, in this hedged equity environment day in, day out. Just anecdotally, what's it been like for you guys over the course of the past month? As are, are people coming to you more? Are they responding to the uh, to the approach out there? What's it been like for you guys, just from a you know overall uh, experience wise over the last month? As we're seeing this massive volatility and massive downturn, and people people awakening once again to the concept of hedging, sir. Well. First of all, everyone is happy that they're hedged. Um, you know, like I said previously, you know, a lot of the straight up equity products are hurting. You know, they're, they're down with the market or even more than the market. So, I mean, you know, this is where we've always said, you know, this is a, an all weather type of strategy for a full market cycle. And it looks like we're starting to finally get that bear market phase of that full market cycle because the reality is over the last 10 years, we skipped a bear market. And I think we're paying for that right now, right? We're getting two bear markets in one. Um, because we didn't have that normal four to five year business cycle that we're so used to or that we've been trained over the many, many years from our textbooks, right? Markets are supposed to do this. Business cycles are supposed to do this. But what have we had over the last 10 years? We've had a lot of disruption in businesses, you know, coming from the FANG stocks and then that has changed things. But that's how it always is. There's always some type of disruption out there and that's going to warp the business cycle in some way, shape or form. So I really think this sell off is really, I think we are catching up on a missed bear market that we should have had four or five years ago. Um, and that's why it's a little bit more painful right now. So we can never predict these things. We never know, um, you know, when it's going to happen. And so again, you know, I go back to our, our motto here: always invested, always hedged. And so you know, those hedges are paying off right now. And I think what we're really seeing is a lot of overlay clients, a lot of advisors coming out right now um, that want personalized overlays. It's kind of like, hey, I, you know, that caller you talked to me about six months ago or even three months ago, I'm interested now. And 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 so right now. What we have to say is, well, it's not too late, right? I mean, all of us here think that this is a dead cat bounce. The bear market, bear markets just don't recover. And I just don't think this is going to be a V-shaped recovery. Um, like I said, if it is, we're going to have to give it some cute name and because it's going to be the V-shapes of all V-shapes ever. But uh, it's going to take a few months. It's going to take some time. There's still a lot of unknowns out there. Um, and we have been very busy with um, overlay proposals with people who are like, hey, you know, now I'm worried. And I think I said this on a, on a show a, a few times ago. I mean, it was like the when I start hearing more and more people saying I'm never going to buy I put again. That's when I'm like, you better start, you know, you better start buying puts. But, you know, it was difficult because when the, when the going is good, it's difficult to convince someone that something might happen down the road. Um, you need to take action to preserve your wealth uh, so that you can survive these full market cycles. So I think people are now listening and, and perking up I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I, I remember you talking to me about a hedge uh, six months ago. Can we revisit that right now? So um, so that's, that's a good thing. And I think, um, you know, when everybody pulls out of this, um, you know, we're going to go back to the way it was. I mean, it, for a few years until something else comes out and the giddy up gets going again. But I think people be be a li little bit more realistic about their portfolios and 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 understand that hedging is a, a vital part of um, preserving wealth over the long run. 
Yeah, it's kind of the uh, the dark side of the business, unfortunately, is when these troubled times are often boom times uh, from an options perspective. No one obviously wants these circumstances, but these are the times that people do, like you said, pick up that phone call. Maybe they didn't want to take it six months ago. Now, hey, I want a custom overlay for my portfolio. So I guess better late than never is the uh, is the tagline there. And you're right about these these V-shaped recoveries and looking at all these analytics from the journal, this one here from Oxford Economics, and they are predicting, this is a survey of different e- economists out there, and they are predicting a pretty sharp v- V-shaped recovery for the latter portion of 2020. And I, I think you're right, Chris, if that does come to pass, if we do somehow shrug off these broad exogenous shocks to the system that are the coronavirus and the economy does recover, even though it's, it seems kind of challenging for that with many large swaths of this country effectively locked down. India now locking down 1.3 billion people, the largest effectively locked down ever. Kind of hard for the global economy to get churning with those things in place. But you're right. If somehow we do shrug this off, it will be the the mother of the mother of the mother of all rallies and all V-shape. V-shape. This will be not even V. This is just straight up, straight up. There's not even a V in the end. It's just a straight up perpendicular line there, which is crazy. Matt, let's, let's take a quick break from pandemic talk. Unless you really want to do more, I'll allow it. But let's give the folks a little bit of a salve, a little bit of a breather here. Uh, you are also the keeper of earnings data and earnings analytics. And I know people may say, what, what the heck, earnings? There's so much other stuff going on right now. But again... Sometimes it's a nice salve on the brain to talk about something finite and micro and something you can actually wrap your head around rather than the surging swath of this pandemic that seems to grow uh, daily. So let's start. Let's look back at last season now that we kind of have it in the rearview mirror. You have your analytics. We were talking about kind of underperformance net, it seemed like, last show for this season is that how the season kind of finished up compared to what the market was pricing in versus the volatility that we actually saw and then perhaps even more importantly even more excitingly for our audience obviously we're going to have probably a bit of a crackerjack crazy season in store for us coming up so what are your thoughts on what we can anticipate for the coming earnings season sir yeah uh, last earnings season was you know, a little worse than, uh, as we talked about, a little worse than normal. Um, you know, we did see, you know, a typical, a typical week four of the six-week cycle uh, perform better. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's been so overshadowed now because you know, basically that earnings season ended and then all, all this uh, coronavirus started. So uh, ne- I, I can't imagine what <laughs> earnings is going to be like next season. It's going to... You know, with all the movement in the stock, and uh, you know, with all the uncertainty surrounding surrounding earnings, um, it's it's going to be it's it's going to be a, let's just put it this way a very interesting uh, earnings season. And one of the things that we do again is is we look at all the components of of, of earnings and and um, you know, uh, for example, the the SPY, all of the uh, all of the symbols in the SPY, and you know, we look at what's what's being implied right now, and that is definitely higher for for the next earnings season. Although it is a little bit early, uh, the implied earnings move is higher than um, than we've seen uh, historically. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a uh, um, a, a pretty crazy earnings season. Um, you know. I think it might even be time to start pre- preparing for that now. Uh, you know, calendars, uh, buying the earnings month, selling um, selling the the months uh, in the front right now. I think that might be an interesting strategy for for a few of these stocks. But yeah, that's what we're seeing now: market earnings. Speaking of interesting strategies, we have to get to one next. That is. This is one of the few times we're ever going to talk about it, listeners, at least in a favorable light. So let's get to it. A little bit of the old Options 101. It's time to learn how to use options to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. All right, everybody, welcome to Options 101. This is where we break down some basic options concept that you guys can utilize in your or indeed your clients' portfolios. And we've talked before about this strategy many times on this program and on DL on the network. Pretty much 99.9% of the times, it is not exactly in glowing terms. 
It's usually <laughs> it's a poor choice. It's a difficult trade to make work, even if you're a professional and very seasoned in the space. Uh, the things you have to do to make this strategy work are usually not worth it and certainly not viable for a lot of busy advisors who don't have the time or certainly for the retail out there who don't have the expertise or the account margin set up to really do. What am I talking about? I'm talking about long straddles. Yes, the long straddle. The Again, the position we've mocked many times that we said years ago was – a position you used to hear a lot of late night scammers hawking this thing saying you can make money in any market condition using options. And what they were talking about were long straddles. What are we talking about? Very quickly, brief overview if you want more. Again, go back into the archives. We've talked about this more at length then. This is kind of just a bit of a refresher for the current environment. Long straddle, a long call, and a long put on the same strike. Typically, they are at the money strikes. That's usually where straddles are done. You could do them a little bit beyond, a little bit in the money on one strike, all the money on the other strike, but usually for just ease of use and, and ease of calculation and, and cost savings. Uh, it's done on the, uh, on the at-the-money front. Now, let's see XYZ, for example, XYZ trading 50. You want to buy a one-month XYZ at-the-money straddle. Let's say you buy the 50 call. Let's say in our sample is trading a dollar. 50 put, also trading a dollar. You buy them both. That's two bucks. So you can see there, A, what you get there. You have a strategy that can make money if the market goes up and make money if the market goes down. You paid two bucks, though, so you have to move at least two bucks net for that to break even, and that's the challenge for it. The upside is that you can make money no matter where the market goes, as long as it goes. It's got to go somewhere. (laughs) The downside is that it often doesn't go exactly where you want it to go. Quite frequently, it doesn't do it in the time you need it to do. Remember, if you're a long straddle, it's what I often call a death by a thousand cuts. You're long two at the money options. And if you know anything about the Greeks, and again, if you don't check out our earlier episodes, you know time decay, aka theta, occurs most rapidly on that front month at the money strike. That's where these things are just eroding every day. And now you have two options, so you pay twice as much. So these are this is not a situation where you could afford to sit around it. You need this thing to happen, and you need it to happen quickly. If it happens at the end of that straddle's life, You may have already lost enough decay where it's not worth your time to do, which is why we say this is the challenging position. It's expensive, suffers terribly from time decay. And what professionals used to have to do, what we used to do on the trading floor all the time, is do what's called gamma scalp. Sell stock above, buy stock back below that at the money strike. And try to do that over and over again to try to defend this position against the amount of money you're losing to decay. And hoping that at one time you get that nice home run that makes it all pay off. But it's, it's a challenge. But right now, why we bring it up right now is this is one of the few times... Long straddles, there's so much volatility in the market, and they're, they're crazy expensive, and yet they're still not expensive enough because they're actually working. I'll give you an example we have on our Options Playbook radio show. We had our, our host there, Brian, talk about a long straddle in USO, a stock that was about $6 at the time, an ETF. And that long straddle paid off handsomely. The stock moved a dollar and a half, even in a $6 stock. Uh, so long straddles right now, they are working. They are moving. But it shows you also what kind of crazy, unprecedented environment we need to have in order for these things to actually make sense. Chris, I know you have some thoughts on this, so we'll start with you, sir. (laughs) Crazy times. That's how crazy it is. This is the sign of the times. We're talking about long straddles in a favorable light. What do you want to say to our listeners out there who are maybe considering this, some use cases, some pros and cons? Have at it, sir. Yeah, so um, volatility is a relative thing, and I think Matt and I have been pounding the table here. When and and when we talk vol, we're talking VIX, right? That seems to be the universal language of love here. Um, when VIX is low, um, realizes even lower, and that's actually probably a better time to be short volatility. And now we're in the opposite opposite end, where realized volatility is extremely high, and the VIX isn't quite pricing that, and the VIX is a 30 calendar today strip of options and a volatility and the best guess of what's going to happen 30 days out. But if you look at shorter time frames, like if you look at the historical vol and the SPX from a five-day perspective, the five-day historical vol right now is a 100. The 10-day historical volatility is a 118 with a VIX at a 60. So think about that. If you want to sell vol at a 60 VIX and you can walk away for the next 30 days you got a shot at making some money. But in the shorter time frame, you can buy that straddle right now. And with the, histor- with the historical and realized vol that's happening right now, you can actually scalp away on that. So I think volatility, you know, people are always should be automatically selling a 60 because people are, have been programmed to sell absolute levels. And what did we do on the floor? What have we always done when we were trading? It's about relative. I have no problems buying a 60 VIX. And some people are going to be like, you're crazy because I'm in a market environment where I can turn around 
around and sell a 65 VIX or 70 VIX. At some point, that'll shift and go the other way, right? I mean, not too long ago, everyone was selling 12 VIX and making money. So, you know, that's that. That's that's what happens during volatility transitions. And right now we're in a a high ball environment. And what you have to do is dust off strategies. You've got to dig into your toolbox to some tools that you haven't used in a long time and say, wow, I've got to use this tool right now for this type of environment. So I'm just kind of warning people that, yeah, it's very enticing to sell that 60 VIX right now. But just keep in mind that you may suffer some pain over the next five to 10 days when five day historical vol is at a 100 and 10 day historical vol is at a 118. Mr. Matt, talking about digging into that toolbox, sir, what are your thoughts on this tool that's usually buried in the back of the toolbox getting moved to the fore these days, the long straddle, sir? One of the first trades I ever put on was a, a long straddle, and I went upstairs, and my backers are like, what are you doing buying a straddle? And, <laughs> that sounds um, about right. Yeah, and so I, 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 you know, then I started backing traders, and, and so we had to be either flat or long. So we would find the stocks that would have what, what Chris was talking about, the, the actual volatility where we could scalp that gamma, where we it had the movement. And one of the, one of the things that we learned in doing millions of back tests at ORATS is, is even in high vol environments, long straddles tend to work. The, the rule of thumb is – uh, the market doesn't get volatility low enough in those those really uh, dark days when the, the when the market's not moving very much, and they don't get it high enough in these types of uh, situations. So exactly what Chris was saying: the realized volatility is so much higher than what the volatility is offered in the market that there that that says opportunity in buying straddles. So you know at at market. At market um, you know, heights, that's actually an opportunity. It seems counterintuitive, but that that is what ha- that is what happens with some of these straddles. Of course, you got to have to have rules for for hedging, scalping. Sometimes, what I like to do is put on a straddle and then take if it goes up, take off a, co- a couple of the calls, and then, so you just kind of get out of the straddle um, he- hedging, so you don't have to do the underlying so much. So, uh, you know. Buying straddles has always been near and dear to my heart. That's how we do a lot of testing for the the earning cycles, and um, and these are the times when they really pay off. Mark, yeah, it shows how just crazy and turbulent these times are. Mr. Eric, any thoughts for you? You're out there virtually talking to advisors right now, and your thoughts on the the use case for straddles for advisors in this environment, sir? Well, look, you know, advisors will be looking at this, sort of anticipating some big price moves, but you know, I would give some clarity to it and and Chris and uh, Matt sort of uh, having their experience being down on the floor. The advisors that might be doing this typically for their own accounts, you know, a lot of firms would uh, look at this mark as a multi-leg. So it might be a level two or level three at certain firms. So advisors might not be able to uh, integrate this type of trade. But look, you know, um, you know, you you all three said, you know, (laughs) at this time, I'm, it's something to consider, and we're surely the investor services folks I know are uh, in Chicago and such are getting calls about this. But uh, you know, I just would say to the advisors that are interested, you've got firms out there like Orats and Swan that uh, you might want to seek out a professional when you're looking at this kind of thing. And you want to seek out some professionals for a little bit of our help with your questions. It is time for our office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or stocktwits.com slash Slash options insider. All right. Obviously, a lot of you have questions in these troubled times, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll run a little long to get to see if I can hold these guys a little bit extra so we can get uh, some more of your questions answered. Really quickly, we've been asking you guys questions over this past couple of weeks, too, to get your pulse on the market. We asked you about a week ago what you thought about volatility. Was skyrocketing market melting down? What are you guys up to at this point? Were you short and riding it down? Were you starting to nibble? At long positions at those levels, were you at cash till it blows over or other? And about 54% of you said you were nibbling, starting to nibble at long positions at those levels, which was about a week ago. I can understand uh, some of you liking that level. 28% saying you're short and riding it down. 14 almost 15% saying you're in cash 
till all this madness blows over. But fast forward to this week. In fact, yeah, not that long before this show, we put this live. You guys are already flocking into this one. This is, uh, you know, we just on the heels of yesterday's insane mother of all rallies, and we'll see what happens today, but so far, mother of all rallies. Uh, we had raced past 2,400 in the S&P. Stimulus fever was out there with the markets. Everyone was rally ho mode. Uh, so we thought we'd ask you guys, again, similar, broad kind of macro question. Do uh, you guys think this has legs? I think 2,400 in the S&P. Where, where are we going to close this week? That was the broad question we asked you. Is going to be closed north of 2,400, a.k.a. this upside move has some legs, or south of 2,400, a.k.a. this is a bit of a dead cat bounce, or who cares, I'm in cash. And as of a few minutes ago, again, the votes are still flocking in hot and heavy. We've got about a day left, listeners. If you haven't played at options, is the place to go. Make your vote, vote heard. 73% saying Dead cat bounce are going to be below 2,400, so it kind of sounds like they're in line with most of our panelists here who aren't exactly feeling the love for this rally. About almost 17% saying this is real, and about almost 10% saying, yeah, who cares? I'm in cash. <laughs> I, can't, I can't really fault the latter of you out there either. These are certainly crazy markets for a lot of people. Let's get to some of your questions here. Till, Tilly, Tilly, let's go with Till. Till wants to know, the new tax deadline is July 15th. Does that mean the new IRA contribution deadline also July 15th? Uh, Not really an options question, but yeah, we'll get to that one too. We don't usually talk taxes here on the show, but that's a big part of what advisors do out there. And yes, the answer is yes, uh, you have until July 15th to now do your IRA contribution deadlines as well. If you're curious, IRS just put out a fact on this exact uh, issue, all the questions you may have about the new deadline and what it means. So check it out, IRS website irs.gov to go to learn more but yes you have until july 15th to contribute to your ira which could be good because some of you may be maybe hurting a little bit right now and don't want to have to squeeze all that cash off until next uh or till on april 15th uh chris this is one you highlighted last show you said you wanted to come back to it on this show this was an episode we talked about from a question i should say we talked about from alan last show he wants to he, he asked us uh, when corporations announce massive surprise dividends, is this accounted for in the options, or is there an opportunity to purchase puts, take advantage of the expected sell-off in the underlying stock? Last episode, we talked about, you know, if they have questions about this, OCC is the place to go. They usually put out a circular detailing. There will be some sort of adjustment, so usually that means there's really not a free lunch. But uh, you said you had more to add on this, sir, so I have at it. Well, just a little bit here, and maybe we can talk about it again some other day. But I think this is actually going to come into play right now because dividends is one of the inputs into an option pricing model. And so this is this is asking about, well, should I buy puts because I expect a dividend cut? And unfortunately, we may be in an environment where, um, you know, we don't know, like Matt said, we don't know what earnings are going to come out or are going to be over the next quarter. Um, you know, if – if companies do need to raid cash, maybe they're not getting enough from the government right now. I don't know what the situation is going to be. But if companies do need to raise cash, well, they can synthetically raise cash by doing what? They can cut their dividends. Um, so that's going to be something to look at. I mean, if you can find companies with poor cash flows um, on their balance sheet or are not quite getting um, you know, the economic stimulus – that they should be or, or you think they may, they may have to come out down the road, especially if their earnings aren't good enough, they, where they have to cut the dividends. And in that case, yes, um, you know, divid- uh, puts would increase in value because your forward rate is going to decrease and that does increase puts. So I think it's something to, that could be in play with what's going on in the marketplace here. But, but then again, you know, remember, you're not really – it takes some inside information sometimes to, to figure out whether uh, a company's going to cut dividends. It's kind of a guess unless, and, and it really isn't one of the major parts of an option pricing model. So if you're an advisor out there, I'm probably not recommending you to do dividend plays, um, especially right now with the high volatility, you know, to buy a put fine, you're going to make a little bit on a dividend cut, but the reality is you're taking so many other risks right now with what the market is doing. I'd probably keep it as it's a good exercise to look for, but um, you know it's going to be very difficult to predict what options or what companies will cut dividends. I mean, I, I used to tr- do dividend plays back in the day, and I, I had where rumors were going out where the you know a certain company cash flows were terrible, guaranteed that they're going to cut dividends. People start putting on all these strategies where you're expecting a dividend cut, and then literally the company comes out and raises their dividend. So it can go both ways. So just be careful. But again, with with What's going on right now in the marketplace? There's a lot of opportunity and other things, and I guess you can you can look at the dividends. But again, there's a, there's too many other things going around right now to really focus on on small dividend plays, especially for advisors. 
So you were the div play guy. That was you putting up all that paper. Now, now I understand, Chris, where all that where all that came from. All right, next up, we got quite a lot. In fact, a lot of people have different flavors of this same question. We've been asked many different ways this exact question of late. And understandably, this one happens to come from NA, NNJ66, but a bunch of you have the same question on your brains. You want to know what happens if the stock is halted or exchanges are shut down when I own puts. A lot of people are concerned about this. They have an option on. Typically, it's a put as a hedge that they're writing in about. And hey, the exchanges are halted. The stocks exchange, the options exchanges are closed. I can't close my position even if I want to. What the heck should I do? Mr. Eric, typically I, I usually send people to OCC for this type of thing anyway, but as it just so happens, the folks over at OCC perhaps having a little bit of foresight, thinking they might be getting this question once or twice, have gone ahead and put out a guide exactly for this just a week or two ago called the OCC Unscheduled Market Closings Guide. If you have this question, listeners, and clearly a lot of you do, that's what you want to look up. OCC Unscheduled Market Closings Guide. Just go to the OCC website and you should find it there. Mr. Cott, are you hearing similar inquiries about this these days? And uh, what are your thoughts about people accessing this market closings guide, sir? Well, I think it was timely, absolutely, Mark, that that guide was put out. And I would encourage uh, your listeners and others you know, to go to theocc.com, T-H-E, OCC.com. Uh, I think uh, their questions will be answered. Also to let them know about the 888 options number. I have a question to ask Chris. Is his license plate? D I V P L A P L A Y. Does he have a div play license plate or is his <laughs> cell phone number D I V P L A Y? Cause I think he should apply for that. Uh, if not, maybe Amberson will uh, get that as his uh, cell phone number. But, uh, being uh, all kidding aside, I would uh, again, encourage Mark listeners to go to the OCC.com to access that. That was put out this month. I think you have to live in Philly to have a div play license plate. And if you're in the option space, you, you will get that joke. A couple other quick ones. Then I'll let these guys uh, head back about their business. You guys have a lot of questions and comments right now. Like our last show, Funding for Capital, we were talking about, even on our last show a month ago, was it too late to hedge your client's portfolio? It was a topic we were discussing on the show last week, or last episode, I should say. And Funding for Capital was listening. He chimed in and said, oh, laugh out loud. They should have been hedged from the beginning. Well, yeah, I think we all agree with you there, Funding for Capital. But this show is quite often for people who aren't or who are learning or dipping their toes in for the first time. And so for those people, sometimes you gotta, you got to ease them into the water before they drink. And so, yes, I, I think theoretically you are correct, but practically that is not always the case. All right, Mr. Matt, we could answer questions for hours here, but we'll take it home on this one. This one is right up your alley. You are, in addition to the keeper of all the earnings data, you also have a fine, fine little back test machine over there at Orats. And it sounds like Mr. Every Trade wants to plug something into it. Every Trade says, hello. Well, hello. So I have a question for the advisor's option program. I would like to know when is it, when, excuse me, when is the best time to take off a long put position on a stock? Is it when the stock hits the strike? Is it before or after? Thank you very much. Mr. Matt, you're my go-to guy for all sorts of tactical execution discussions these days because you have the data to back up your analysis. What do you have to say for our friend here, Mr. Every Trade? And I'm sure Quite a few others out there who have similar questions right now. When should they be thinking? They got to put on. They were savvy. They put it on before all this madness hit. Maybe they're blowing through strikes now. Maybe they're getting close to strikes. What should they do, sir? Yeah, and this is a, an answer, a general answer, obviously, for each person. It's going to vary. But, you know, the millions of back tests that we do, we test this. And, you know, as you know, Chris and I have talked before, you know, my favorite back test is the long put, you know, very long-term put, way out of the money. And what we found a sweet spot for that is when you've made about 300% on it, when it's tripled in value, uh, you could let some go uh, and try to monetize it, as, as we said. But, of course, you know, in this type of a pandemic, uh, it, you would have done better to, to wait. Um, so, it, 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 again, it depends on, on, on your personal uh, investments as well, because you know these p- puts are really <laughs> the only asset class that have been working. Gold hasn't even you know it's been working okay, but you know everything goes down sometimes, and puts are the only things that go up. So sometimes put- puts are your only asset class that are going up. 
And in that type of a case, you, you know, you might want to hold it. You know, your house, the value of your house is going down. The value of your portfolio is going down. Your bonds are going down. Gold's going down. Puts are the only thing going up. So it 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 depends. But you know, the the again, again the rule of thumb. You know, if if you've made a substantial amount on them, um, you know, we don't really look at you know in the money, out of the money. What we have, we've tested those, but that that really doesn't. Um, that doesn't back test uh, with, with any uh, degree of relevance for, for us. Um, it's either uh, it, it's either you know kind of a, a profit amount of profit, or uh, you know sometimes way in the money deltas. It's it's uh, back tests have shown uh, to get out of it then, but it, you know it depends on what you're protecting and, and what you're trying to accomplish with your puts, Mark. Yeah, it's hard to just have a blanket category. Okay, five percent. 3%, 2%. I mean, obviously, when you put these on, you should have some plan in place ahead of time. That's I think that's the key, and what Matt's getting at there, is you have to have some plan in place for when you want to take these off, and also that is varies by what your concerns are and what your goals are. If these puts you're buying are a catastrophe hedge, then you really want to let them run. I think 300%, as Matt was saying earlier, you want to let that catastrophe hedge work for you. If you took off your if you had a catastrophe hedge, you took it off two weeks ago, guess what? It didn't really work out too well for you. It worked out all right. But you're still owning the rest of it, and now you're probably wearing it on that trade. So in times like this, if you have a catastrophe hedge, you need to let it run. But that's the challenge, and be able to pay for that over time is also a big challenge. Hence the existence of this show. But unfortunately, that music means we've already gone beyond our allotted time. So let me go back around the horn really quickly, check in with everybody, see what they have cooking that may interest you. Let's start first with uh, the Director of Education and BizDev bifurcated title over there at OIC. Mr. Cott, if advisors and their clients are a little bit worried right now and, and who could blame them and they're stuck at home, maybe they want to learn a thing or two about options, where should they go? What should they do? Well, you teed me up for that brilliantly. Thank you, Mark. Optionseducation.org is our website. 888 Options. I would absolutely emphasize the gentlemen that man the investor services at OIC are excellent. You know, we continue to see very strong registration and attendee numbers for our webinars, et cetera. So I encourage people to do that. And, you know, just a shout out, Mark, to you and, uh, and Chris and Matt, because, uh, you know, at times like these, um, it's, it's so important to be having these kind of digital outreach, especially for the advisor community. So thank you all. There you go. Optionseducation.org is the place to go for advisors. Click on that advisors tab there, log in, register, and you can get access to all that great data, which is handy. At a time like this, shall we say, when clients are a little bit concerned, you can show them how hedging and these types of things, what kind of impacts they could have on their portfolio. Speaking of hedging, Mr. Chris, what you're going to do when we get right back off this show again, go back to the grind uh, of hedging and trying to monetize and pay for those hedges. So if folks are intrigued by such things, maybe they want a little hedged equity in their lives. And I got to figure quite a few people do. Or maybe they want to reach out to you on some of your content, some of the other things you guys have doing, maybe once the tenth boxes resume, maybe you can talk about those or the blog. What's cooking in the land of Swan, sir? Well, we always got like a lot of great material on our website at SwanGlobalInvestments.com. A uh, couple of recent blogs, Unlocking the Power of Leaps, which is very appropriate for right now. Um, you know, a lot of people are always trading in the front month, so this is a great opportunity to learn about longer dated options and, and, and incorporate those into your hedging profile. And also the importance of consistency of returns. Again, you know, you want to be hedged over full market cycles because, again, it's about math. It's about losing less when markets turn to the downside and then being able to recuperate as much as possible on the upside. And that's really what's going to build wealth over the long run. There you go. SwanGlobalInvestments.com is the place to go for all that stuff. You can also find a fun show called The Advisor's Option there, which you might want to check out. I guess if you listen to this, you might like it. But you can see all the other episodes there as well. And, of course, last but not least, Mr. Matt, if I have questions about backtesting or analyzing some of my option strategies, maybe I, want to, maybe I want to reach out to the Oracle of New Hampshire out there on all things volatility and what's going on for vol in the future. Where should I go? What should I do, sir? Yeah, hit me up at uh, Matt at O-Rats uh, You know, appreciate the show. Appreciate Eric, uh, you know, reiterating, looking at these graphs. I think they can be very important for advisors to give a sense to their clients. You know, I've had some, I've had some of my clients that represent uh, inv- investors 
call up and say, you know, what's going on? The vols really come down, but it's, you know, and so I said, here, here are some graphs. Here's what's happening historically. It really helps advisors, you know, to see historically what has gone on with this volatility and plan some moves and get ahead of it. So, you know, I really think it's, it's important to look at option information, derived option information like implied volatility. We have it graphed historically. You know, I've been posting it on, on LinkedIn, uh, you know, link with me there. And and see what we're saying. I, I think it's been super. It's been incredibly helpful for me and for our, uh, my clients. Um, and then, in addition to that, here at ORATS, we got uh, you're going to see some live ORATS, Mark. You're going to see uh, we're uh, we're on the multicast feed. Uh, real time ORATS is coming, so that's going to be um, a, a lot of fun. Uh, real time opportunities, um, imp- implementing these option strategies, uh, scanning, and, and the like. So. Uh, exciting times, and, and it's uh, it's great to be part of the market, uh, and it's great great to be on the show. And Eric and Chris, uh, stay safe. Uh, hope your families and everything are well. Getting in the live action, I like it. Check it all out for yourselves, there, listeners. Orats, that's O R A T S dot com, and give them a follow on the old Twitters while you're at it. At Option Rats, one of the more memorable handles <laughs> out there. And on behalf of Matt and Chris, and Eric, and indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in so many great questions. Maybe we'll have to do a whole other uh, Q&A special episode again, because you guys certainly have a lot of questions. There's just a lot for us to get through on a show like this, listeners. But we'll get to more of you, I promise. And we'll see you back here next time for more of The Advisor's Option. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.